Yeah, so I think that's a nice one. Um, the effect of because you've you've mentioned you you still are a full time doctor and and producing videos. How has that had an effect on your on your life? Is there is there is there uh, you you've spoken a lot about you know it's 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 okay you you're enjoying it, but is it ever too much when you're kind of like coming back from a long shift and you realize that you have to do that much content creation as well? And is it is it ever too much? Um. I don't think it's ever too much. I think it just requires a bit of forward planning. Like, um, if I wasn't working full time, it would be a case of okay, I can just release a video. I can I can make a video today that I'll, re I'll release tomorrow. But that but because I'm working full time, it's a case of kind of planning more in advance. It's a case of kind of uh, having a Zoom call with my team now and being like, okay, guys, what are we doing uh, for the rest of the month in terms of content? We've got these videos planned for this date. We form a calendar on Notion, we kind of figure out what's going on. And we'll be like, okay, we need the scripts of these five videos ready by the weekend so I can film five videos in a row on the weekend. And that's my job for today and tomorrow to film five videos. Um, but then those five videos will help form content for the next like four weeks. So that is kind of how the equation changes once you uh, once your time becomes more limited. And I think uh, the, the idea of batching was another thing I came across in four hour work week that you want to batch similar tasks to, uh, together. And like, it's such a ball ache setting up the camera and the lights and everything. Like I wish I had a dedicated studio for it, but it takes like half an hour just to get the camera set up. And so if I only film one video at a time when, I have, when I've got the camera set up, that is super inefficient, right? Because, you know, I'm, I've, got, I've got this hour, half an hour of time that's yeah. wasted. And so if I can film as many videos as possible in that time, then I'm really winning. And I remember there was a time like last July where across, I, I, I happened to have two days off work because I was like on nights or something. And in that time, I filmed like nine videos and that was content for the next two months. So I was like super chilled for those two months because I was like, I literally filmed nine videos in those two days. Like that was great. Uh, and then it was just editing that needed to be done. So that is how I think about it these days. Batching. That's really cool as well. I, what about for studying? Would, would you kind of say batching helps? Um, like would you, I find some inertia when I'm, when I'm picking up a new subject or a new topic and, and when I'm studying, because even my math has kind of like, once you, I guess, whenever you start a degree, you find out that, you know, when you say a subject's name, it, it suddenly uh, like kind of turns into a fractal with a huge bunch of branches and into what it can become. Um, so like even right now, even though I've kind of focused on the application side of math, it still has a lot of diverse topics and ideas and concepts and yeah. completely different uh, methodologies. Um, would you say that you, if as a student, would, I, would it be better if I plan my time, you know, it's, while I'm in the mindset of, of you know, studying mathematical modeling should i just keep going and do 10 hours on that or do you think you should like mix it up i think the matching idea work on that i mean sorry yeah so i think th there's there's two stages of studying there's the understanding phase and then there's the memorization stage uh, mm. in, in maths i get the impression that there is a lot less memorization than there is understanding uh, i think when it comes to the understanding stage you do have to grapple with it for an extended period of time. Like that's where the, the deep work comes in. Even in medicine, yeah. there are as much as I, I hate on medicine and say it's just memorization, <laughs> there are bits of it that you have to understand. Like it can be tricky to get your head around the physiology of how the kidneys work and how blood filtration, pressure, flow, volume, uh, you know, oncotic pressure, capillary static, hydrostatic pressure, all, all of these different numbers. I suppose it's more the math stuff that requires the understanding. That yeah. takes a few hours to literally like really sit down and use different resources, watch YouTube videos, and really try and get your head around it. And there's no substitute for that. You do have to put in the time. But I think once you're in the memorization stage, once you've understood it, and now you're just kind of using active recall and spaced repetition, there is some evidence that interleaving, like, you know, doing something for a little bit and then switching to something else, and then switching to something else, there is some evidence that interleaving is actually more efficient for retaining information. And again, that's talked about in the book, Make It Stick, which is very good. Cool. And you, you kind of mentioned planning uh, a little bit during the, this whole kind of conversation as well. Um, what are some ways that we could get more efficient at, at planning our time? Um, for me, sometimes I think like I'm going to sit down and, and write down all the kind of slots of time I have available during the day and my time, try to timetable it all. And it, it, it feels like an extra piece of work to do. And you know what, what, what if I just dive in and straight start doing the questions anyway? Um, what would you say to that? Okay, so uh, I think there are there are three elements of productivity, uh, and the metaphor that I'm using, which is what my upcoming Skillshare class is going to be about, is there's the pilot, the plane, and the engineer, and mm -hmm. the pilot is the person who sets the course. The plane is the machine that is executing the orders of the pilot, and the engineer is the dude who's or the or the girl whose job it is to make the whole process more efficient. 
And I think uh, if I were to plug numbers out of thin air, I think we should spend probably about 85% of our time being the plane, being like executing on orders. We should spend maybe 10% of our time being the pilot, i.e. planning what we're going to do. And we should spend 5% of our time being the engineer, i.e. building a system, improving our typing speed, lubricating the whole process so that it's more efficient. And I, th- I suspect the issue that most of us struggle with is in being the plane, not in being the pilot. Most people would probably say, I struggle to sit down and do the work, i.e. taking off. Most people would probably say, I struggle to stay on course when I'm flying, i.e. I, I struggle with distractions. That is the bit that we, are, that we all struggle with. Most people probably won't say that I, I, I actually get loads of stuff done, but I just feel like I'm kind of doing the wrong things. And I feel like if I had a bit more of a three-year plan, a five-year plan, a 10-year plan, if I followed David Allen's getting things done methodology of horizons of focus, about, most people are not in that place where making the pilot better would actually help. Most of us are in the place where making the plane better would help. And so I would kind of agree with you. I would say that if the planning aspect of it is just another bit of work, then it becomes an exercise in procrastination. It's like me every time I try to make a revision timetable. I spend a whole day making a revision timetable and I never stick to it because it's just another way to procrastinate. So I think if we know that within ourselves and everyone listening to this is probably true for them, the plane is the bit we struggle with. That is the bit we should focus on. We should focus on being able to sit down and do the work and not getting distracted while doing the work. And that will have so many better benefits for us than worrying about, do I want to use Notion? I don't want to use Vroom to plan out my day properly in advance. (laughs) That sort of thing. Yeah. Well, you mentioned Notion in Rome. Um, people are kind of getting behind this idea of digital gardens. Um, what is it? Tell us a little bit about that. Um, so my understanding of a digital garden is just like it's a, essentially a, a second brain almost. It's like a digital version of notes that is very kind of interconnected, which is sort mm-hmm. of the idea of how a brain works. So for example, you might be creating a digital garden online. Uh, on your website where you would write some thoughts about productivity or about happiness or about meaning or about money or about uh, fulfillment. These are some of the areas that I'm interested in. And so if I'm developing a digital garden, I'm like uh, sort of within the productivity bit, I'm linking to books, podcasts, articles that I find useful. I'm linking to my own thoughts on it. I'm writing some stuff. It's this idea of building this kind of second brain. But usually when people say digital garden, they mean kind of doing it publicly, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Yeah, um, that stuff I've started looking more into these days, but it's something that just wasn't on my radar when I was younger. And mm, okay, okay, I was just gonna ask you, like, kind of use the analogy of talking about cultivating that garden, mm. and what do you think continues to grow it? But I guess that's that's more about kind of like listening to more podcasts, reading more books, and spending more time thinking about the, those kind of yeah. issues, challenges. And I think if you're if you're at the point where you're thinking about developing a public digital garden your problem probably is not on the consumption side. You probably listen to enough podcasts and read enough books if you're Mm. at that level. Your problem is probably that you're not spending the time, you're not spending two hours after reading every book to sort of formulate your thoughts on it. uh, There's a good book by Sonki Arens called How to Take Smart Notes that talks about the slip box or Zettelkasten method of note-taking, et cetera. That That is stuff that will not be helpful to the majority of students below university level like watching this right now if you try and get into that fine sure fine if you're if you're a super nerd uh, and you're into that sort of stuff then then great that's absolutely fine but i think if if you're the sort of person who struggles with maintaining motivation who struggles with distraction struggles with focus struggles with you know putting yourself out there which is most of us when we're younger then that is probably a bit too niche and i would suggest focusing on the simple things building a foundation first before worrying about, do I really want to use Notion or Roam or Obsidian or whatever to formulate my digital garden? And I think that's just a, another sort of niche nerdy thing that, it, that doesn't actually move the needle for mm. most of us. Mm. What, what, what do you think? Like, how do you do it? How do you put yourself out there time and time again? And why is it so important? Because for me, I found that uh, as a shy uh, kid at school who, who, who could hardly speak to you know, his friends with, more, with confidence, and doing doing what I'm doing now, I've realized the importance of putting yourself out there. Um, but how, how have you kind of gone about it and continue to improve yourself? Yeah, so for me, the the tipping point was when I was 16. I'd just done, done my GCSEs. I got, what was it, 14 A stars or something, something like that. And oh. on results day, uh, my mum and I, we had a meeting with the headmaster and he was like, oh, congratulations, blah, blah, blah. You know, you did well in your GCSEs. I was like, thanks, man. Um, and then he was like, what do you want to do with your life? And I was like, I, w- I want to do medicine. 
And we kind of had a bit of a chat about that. And then at the end of it, he said, uh, and this was a great service that he did that he did to me. He said that, look, I'm going to tell you something that no one else is going to tell you, but I think you need to hear it. And he said that, I think you come across as a bit of a robot. Like you're saying you want to do medicine, but you haven't smiled once when you've talk, talked about it. You talk in a quiet, sort of logical, somewhat stilted robotic fashion without much emotion in it. Um, and I was like, damn, you're right. And, he said, and so what he suggested to me was that I make more of an effort to kind of ask questions in class to make my voice heard and to try and uh, sort of develop this charisma, this empathy, this essentially putting yourself out there, which is helpful if you want to apply for medicine. Because I was very much sort of straight A student, just kind of focused down, playing World of Warcraft, doing my work and kind of talking in this sort of tone. And, you know, I suppose being one of those people that doesn't really, you know, talk very much or isn't very much out there. And so after that, um, I started making it a point that in every in every kind of big group setting, I was going to I was going to ask a question. Uh, and I think firstly, that just helps you engage with stuff a lot more. Like if you're thinking, what question am I going to ask at the end of this lecture? You engage with the lecture a lot more. And that's mm. how I've continued to this day. Like a few months ago, I was in Belfast in Ireland for a YouTuber video conference. And there were like 500 people in the audience, including me. And there were these big names on stage. Peter McKinnon gave a talk. Sean Duras gave a talk. These are people with like millions of subscribers on YouTube. Uh, and I made a point that at the end of every talk, I was going to ask a question. And it became a meme almost across those two days. Everyone knew that I, you know, me, this dude <laughs> with the camera, I, I was going to be the one asking the question. And all the speakers started joking about it. Um, and I was so surprised. You know, I paid a few hundred dollars to attend this conference, I'd had every, as had everyone else. But I was the only one who was brave enough to put myself out there, to put my hand up and ask a question to these people that I'd been following on YouTube for years and years. And it got me thinking, like, you know, why do we all struggle with this? And I, I think, like, as, as you rightly said, it's this fear of being judged. It's this fear, like, you know, I think Epictetus famously said that, you know, the, the fear of being thought foolish is one of the greatest problems of humanity. We all are really worried that we're going to be thought foolish. You interviewing me right now, what's probably going through your mind is, oh, I, you know, Ali is like dropping all these bombs of wisdom and I feel <laughs> like I'm not necessarily engaging with them as well as I should. I feel like I should probably, I'd be adding more, maybe asking some better questions. I wonder if all these people listening to the conversation are going to think I'm a shitty interviewer because I'm asking these bad questions. That's probably what's going through your mind. But no one else is thinking that. I'm not thinking that. I'm thinking, damn, he's asking some really good questions. Um, I want to sort of drop bombs of sort of snippetable wisdom, but really I don't have any original thoughts. I'm just quoting from Naval and Derek Sivers and Tim Ferriss and Gary <laughs> Vaynerchuk. I'm, I'm quoting from all these people. I have, no, I, have, I have nothing original to say. You know, these people are going to think I'm a fraud because actually I'm just parroting other people's advice. But I guarantee no one is thinking that. They're probably thinking, oh, Ali's dropping some pretty reasonable bombs of wisdom and, you know, Zubair is asking some good <laughs> questions. Like there's this concept in psychology called the spotlight effect which is this idea that we all go through life as if we have a spotlight trained on us and that as if kind of every, every minor mishap, every faux pas, everything that we do, other people are watching and judging. Actually, no, no one is judging it. Everyone is just thinking about themselves. And so kind of recognizing that and understanding it means that that is the first step towards this idea of putting yourself out there. And for me, the second step was reading a book called Show Your Work by Austin Kleon. And I've got multiple Ooh. copies of it that I often give away to people when they come visit me. And that basically, it's, it's a book about self-promotion for people who hate the idea of self-promotion. Like we all worry that, okay, well, I guess I'll kind of want to put myself out there, but I don't want to look like a bit of a narcissistic tart for putting myself out there. And it very strongly argues that, you know, if you're showing your work, if you're sharing your process, if you're sharing your thoughts on stuff, you know, people will, will want to hear that. And if they don't, they won't go on your website. And if they do, then they'll enjoy it. And there's a, there's this idea, um, uh, th th there's a, a thing called a serendipity vehicle, um, which is the idea that um, most of the good things in life come from serendipity. Serendipity is the idea, kind of, kind of like having these strokes of luck. Yeah. Like if you talk to most kind of uh, any sort of successful people, they would say that, yeah, there was a load of luck involved in how I got there. Like I just happened to meet my co-founder at just some random event that I happened to go to, or we were just kind of chatting to each other one day on the train. And it turns out that, you know, I've ended up marrying this person, like all these serendipitous things that you just can't predict in advance. And I think one of the issues, especially amongst kind of medics, uh, and I speak for myself kind of in this, is that we are very keen to, we're keen to know exactly what the outcome of stuff is going to be before we do it. Like we're thinking, okay, how is this good for my CV? If I do this extra career productivity, will it give me two more points on my freaking foundation year application? We, we want the path to be charted out in front of us and only then will we do the work. Whereas another idea I came across on a podcast last year was this idea of kind of window openers versus door knockers. Now, the window openers are the people who want to look at the result through a window 
like they can see it on the other side and then they'll open the window and kind of walk through. Whereas the door knockers are the people who will knock on the door, but not know what's on the other side. But you'd knock on the door anyway, and you'd open the door and you'd see what's on the other side. You would take the chance. And increasingly, they were saying in this podcast, which I agree with, increasingly in this day and age, more success, however you want to define it, will come to the door knockers rather than the window openers. We're moving far less into this world where, so I, I suppose back in the day, yeah, you got good grades, you got a good job, you sort of got your company car. It kind of worked. And then, and then you're winning at life. But now it's not about that. Like success, however you want to define it, will come from taking these risks. And going back to this idea of the serendipity vehicle, putting yourself out there by doing stuff like writing online or making videos, that is a serendipity vehicle. It is, it is a, a thing that is out in the world that allows you to manufacture serendipitous events. Had I not been putting myself out there on YouTube, you and I wouldn't have connected. We wouldn't have had this conversation. I wouldn't be standing here right now. Um, mm. Had I not put myself out there on YouTube or through my blog, like there are hundreds of different things, good things that have happened in my life as a result of me putting myself out there, which would not have happened at all, which, but, and which I would not ever have been able to predict. Um, and that's kind of the point of serendipity. Like the benefit of putting yourself out there is that you encourage you're increasing the surface area of opportunity for these interactions to take place. You know, I started tweeting more on Twitter. And like my first week of Twitter properly, I connected with a guy called Thomas Frank, who makes amazing productivity videos on YouTube. He and he and I got talking. We hopped on a two hour Skype call. He introduced me to the agency that I'm now part of that's completely changed my life because it's skyrocketed the amount of money I make for sponsorships, which means I can hire people. Like just that thing of me interacting with his tweets, not expecting anything, but just kind of having this chat like led to so many useful things serendipitously. And so that chat with Thomas yeah. Frank changed my life. But had I been like, oh, actually, uh, I don't think there's any value in tweeting. You know, yeah, I've got, I've got a Twitter account, but you know, what's really going to happen? Like, I don't see the benefit because I'm stuck in this medical way of thinking that I need to see the benefit. I need to see the CV points. Then, then none of that would have happened. And so coming back to this idea of putting ourselves out there, why should we do it? Well, because it's going to be really, really helpful for us in the long run in ways that we can't predict. And that's the crucial part of it. So if you're watching this right now, you're thinking that, oh, maybe I want to start a blog, but I don't see how many CV points it's going to get me. You know, realistically, I don't think I can mention it on my personal statement. Maybe that's not quite the right way of looking at it. That's a very old school, old world mentality of, I just need to climb the ladder and then I will get to the top. It's not really how the world, world works anymore. So that is kind of my sales pitch for why everyone should put themselves out there. And stuff like that.